Okay, I'm doing Catholic Law 101. <clears throat> yeah, all right. Well, law. Uh, I don't want to get too legalistic about the law. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes we have to, such as tonight when I'm teaching about Catholic Law 101. Help me, please. Uh, yes. Um, one problem that we face moving into this thing uh, is that English is... I'm going to move... I can't pace, can I? It's a widescreen. It's a widescreen. Okay. Oh, yeah, I need it. I need wide-angle lens, definitely. All right. So, uh, English is very limiting. Uh, we have one word for law that we tend to use in a lot of, of different applications. Uh, if we were still, still speaking Latin, for instance, we would, have, uh, we would have lex and jus, and if we were Germans, we'd have recht, and, uh, and uh, what do they have? Uh, I forget the other German philosophy of John. You know. So uh, we in in French there's uh, there's loi and there's uh, something else, but I'm, I can't speak these things. But the fact the point is that in in a lot of these languages, uh, you take the one word that we have for law and you split it up into a lot of different words used for a lot of different uh, contexts. So, for instance. The law of gravity, if you think about it, and I'll probably be coming back to that a good bit and using it as an example, the law of gravity is a very different concept from uh, the laws of the IRS or even the speed limit law. Uh, do, you all, do you catch an instinctive difference there? There's a difference from the policeman pulling up and saying, well, you just broke the speed limit law uh, as opposed to the law of gravity. It, the sense, what is different about that? Would anybody, oh boy, Socratic mode on. When I don't know the answer, I just ask people the question. Uh, I like you. I like you. That's good. Yes. Um, other than the IRS being more powerful than the law of gravity, uh, which is absolutely true, what, uh, what other differences are there? Oh man, you actually read the chapter? Natural versus man-made. Well, that's, that's part of it. Uh, to a degree, yes. Um, that the law of gravity, first of all, we didn't make... Well, obviously, Newton passed the law of gravity, right? He, he came up with it in the 1600s, right? You've heard me say that before. No, he didn't. Uh, the law of gravity existed uh, long, long before Sir Isaac Newton ever wrote it down. He simply described, and think of the word describe, it essentially means writing down after the fact or, or stating what something is after the fact, right? Uh, as opposed to prescribing uh, medical people, what does is, what is prescribing literally mean? You got to have it before you get the drugs, right? To, to write it down beforehand. So, so one interesting thing about the law of nature is, is that we don't make them. We simply describe what they are. And a law of nature is inherent in nature. It's inherent in what reality is all about. Uh, so you can't really break the law of gravity. Uh, you can know what the law of gravity is, and you can step off a 100-story skyscraper. Uh, but the only thing you're going to break is you, not the law of gravity. All right? So, uh, so you have to understand these different concepts of, of what the law is and the fact that we're using this one word in a lot of different contexts, uh, so you don't find yourself attributing something to the IRS that we really shouldn't. Uh, and that's the first step to understanding Catholic law. Questions, comments? So we've got to be flexible in understanding this word law? Okay. Well, uh, one of the greatest thinkers in the history of the West and one of the two greatest theologians that the church has ever turned out is St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, who lived approximately 800 years ago or thereabouts. Uh, the other of great theologian, if you're interested, is St. Augustine, uh, who lived uh, around the 400s, uh, around 400, give or take, uh, born in the 300s, died in the 400s. Uh, and I think you've heard me talk about how we pronounce his name. It's not St. Augustine, as in the city. It's, it's actually properly referred to in a Germanic tongue like English as Augustine. 
uh, St. Augustine of Hippo. So uh, those are the two great theologians. Uh, Aquinas built a lot on, uh, on what Augustine had, had thought and taught and preached. And in uh, his Summa Theologica gave us one of the truly great, massive uh, theological treatises in history. And one of the things that, uh, that he talked about was the law uh, from the Christian perspective. And he divided it down into these different things. And you can actually see it if you've, uh, if you've read your book. Hold on just a minute here. Oh, I love these iPhones, even though they don't tell me I'm teaching tonight. Wow. Or, uh, and I'm on the wrong page. So we've got, walk me down it. We've got the divine positive. Is it our first on the list? Okay. Well, first of all, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about the difference between positive and natural uh, before we get into to anything else. Now, the divine positive, or po anything positive law, whenever you hear about positive law, and this works in theology, uh, I think it you know, works in the natural sciences as well to a degree. Uh, it works in uh, certainly our American legal system. It probably works in any Western legal system. A positive law is a law that somebody has actually come out and declared, actually come out and stated. Um, it is probably prescriptive. This is the way it's going to be. If you run a stop sign from this day forward, you're going to get something you don't want. Fines or jail terms or something like that. So it's actually expressly stated and written down somewhere so somebody can see it. So that's what we mean by positive law. And to a degree, and you've got to be a little careful with this once you get into the, the field of religion, uh, you get a sense that there may be a little discretion in it. That the speed limit can be either 55 or it can be 65. Uh, it depends on what the lawgiver has decided. And of course, if he writes down a positive law that the speed limit is 55, then nothing stops him from going back next week and saying the speed limit is now 65. All right, that, that there can, in some circumstances, I'm not sure if that's true of divine positive law, but there can be in some circumstances some flexibility there. Uh, and the flexibility, if you want to think about it, is uh, uh, we describe in terms of another word, not law, but policy, which is related to politics. Law is what must be. It's a command. It is what shall be done uh, under penalty of you know, something, uh, prison time or or damnation, or you name it. Uh, whereas policy is what should be done. Should the speed limit be 55 or should it be 65? How many people say 55? How many people say 90? <laughs> I thought that, yeah, okay. So, and you know, you can make different arguments for that, okay? That there are certain advantages in the speed limit being 65, business is transacted more efficiently, society gets richer, uh, the advantages to 55 are fuel is saved and lives are saved. You know, we can, we can argue about that, we can see, you know, we can weigh costs and benefits and decide that even though there are benefits to the speed limit being 55, we decide that it should be 65 and so we're going to base the positive law on that policy. All right, so in at least some circumstances, policy determination goes into what the law is, uh, or the positive law is. All right, so much for the positive law. And now let's look at its uh, counterpart, the natural law. And I've already talked about that some with Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, the natural law is, is just in the nature of things. Okay, it's in the nature of things for mass to attract mass. And I'm not talking about mass, I'm talking about mass. All right? You know, the law of gravitation, you know, mass attracts each other, okay? I mean, that's just the way it is. Uh, that's just how it was designed from the ground up by the designer. And who, of course, designed all the laws of physics but God. You ever think about that? Mathemat you know, when you study mathematics, God used mathematics to invent physics, and then he used physics to create the whole universe. Isn't that cool? So when you study mathematics, you're actually looking into the mind of God. Uh, because there's a lot of order there, a lot of system. Uh, and we think about that in, in an eternal sense, that 
you know, that's just the way things work and that's the way God designed them to work. So once again, you can't really break the law of gravity. All right? you, can, you can step out off that 100 floor skyscraper, but you're, you know, you're breaking yourself by failing to conform to the way things are. You're never going to be able to break uh, the nature of things. Uh, I was, as a matter of fact, I was just uh, uh, taking a walk with a friend of mine, uh, 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 one of our boarders, and he had raised this whole issue of, and I'm just using this as an example, uh, isn't it interesting how Pope Benedict has now allowed the use of condoms to uh, prevent the spread of AIDS? Y'all read about that? He didn't. Yeah, this is, you know, if you've ever doubted the hostility of the secular media to the Catholic Church, this is a perfect example. Uh, Pope Benedict was talking about a hypothetical situation involving a male prostitute with HIV who was thinking, well, maybe it would be decent of me not to infect my clients or partners or whatever. And, and that shows an evolving moral sense, that he realizes there's a difference in right and wrong and he ought to do something that's right. Uh, the press seized on that to say, well, Pope Benedict has said that condom use is moral. He didn't say that. He didn't say, that. he might have, the press might have well have said that Pope Benedict has said that male prostitution is moral, because that was the, the, the hypothetical in which the context was given. Um, that, and, and from there we got onto it, the talk of the Vatican ban on contraception. Well, that makes it sound like a policy. You remember my talk about policy a minute ago? You know, that what should we do? And the Vatican has decided that we should have a ban on contraception. Well, the ban on contraception is part of the natural law. Okay? It's not a policy. It's not positive law. And it, is, it existed long before there was ever a Vatican. It existed from the very beginning of the church. All right? Uh, example. God is love, right? We hear that a lot, don't we? And if God is love, that means the words God and love are interchangeable, right? What's the first, uh, what's the first, uh, the very first verse in the Bible? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Well, let's swap the words out now. Since God and love are interchangeable, what does it say? In the beginning, love created the heavens and the earth. So the very first verse of Judeo-Christian scripture notes the, the procreative, the creative power of love. Love wishes to create. It wishes to pour itself into new life, into new creation. That is the nature of sexual love as the church has always understood it. That, that selfless love is by its nature creative. And if you try to divide that creativity, that procreativity from the unitive aspect, you're simply distorting it. You're stepping off the top of that 100 floor skyscraper. All right? It's, it's not a ban on anything. It's just the nature of, of marital love, of unitive love. It, it is to be procreative. It's not a ban. It's not policy. It's, it's really just built into the nature of things. So you start to see a little bit more strongly that difference between positive law and policy and stuff on the one hand and divine law on the other, the natural law, the law that's just built into the nature of things. I'll stop and ask if anybody's got any questions at this point. It's very interesting, by the way, uh, getting probably ahead of myself a little bit too much, but speaking as a former law professor and a legal scholar, uh, the role of natural law in the American constitutional system. Now, if you go back to the Declaration of Independence, uh, Thomas Jefferson, of course, what are the first seven words of the Declaration of Independence? We the people, we the people of the United States. Wrong! Sorry, that was the Constitution. Trap door. <laughs> no, the Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events, now you know the difference. But it was in 1776, I, I'm sorry, that was bad of me, but I just, I just love doing it. You know, about the only fun I have in life is making students feel small. <sighs> yeah, sorry. And he gets lynched when he goes out the door later, folks. All right. Um, there you go, thanks. Um, yeah, that, that's interesting. Declaration of Independence, 1776, written by Thomas Jefferson. We owe these truths to be self-evident. That's a philosophical term. I won't get into it. 
that all men, and that was back when the words men were inclusive, all humanity is what he meant, were created equal. That they are endowed by their creator, yes, Jefferson believed in God, probably wasn't a Christian but it is, with certain unalienable rights, actually it's inalienable, that's a property term. Uh, a term from real property law or any kind of property law. If I have an inalienable interest in this iPhone, it means I, can't, I am legally incapable of giving it to you or selling it to you or conveying it to you or abandoning it. That It's mine. It is an inalienable interest. That's very powerful. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, by which he meant the pursuit of property, uh, food, clothing, and shelter. Okay. That's a natural law statement. Where do these rights come from? Jefferson just said it, that they are endowed by, by God. That is natural law. That's just the way it is. Interestingly enough, you cannot go into an American courtroom and cite the Declaration of Independence as authority. <laughs> American courts don't recognize the Declaration of Independence in that way. Isn't that interesting? It's very interesting, very, very interesting. For some reason, the American courts have never really been comfortable with the idea of natural law. Uh, and especially in the last 40 or 50 years, I, I think there's a reference to Clarence Thomas, uh, who is a very active and, as far as I can tell, an Orthodox Catholic in this chapter, uh, and how he was grilled when he was being named to the U.S. Supreme Court because he had the temerity to believe in natural law. And yet, it, because this natural law is something beyond the ability of the American government to touch. Okay, the right to life, liberty, or property. That according to Jefferson, according to the Declaration of Independence, according to the natural law view of things, the only thing that government can do in America is to protect the rights that we already have. The government didn't give them to us. God gave them to us. It's government's job to protect it. Uh, and yet, you see people getting very leery uh, of natural law because it's something that government can't control. And we can talk about that when we get to abortion, uh, as a matter of fact. And I will get to that a little bit later. Uh, and yet, as I was going to say, the legal community, the judges, the legal scholars, the law professors, who have done their utmost to do away with natural law in the American courtroom, have yet tried to sneak something like it back in in a thing called fundamental rights. Uh, and fundamental rights, you know, sounds very well, this goes above and beyond anything else. And well, where do they come from? Well, they're fundamental. Yeah, but where do they come from? Well, we just told you they're fundamental. But, but who gave them to you? You see, they, they want it to be natural law, they want it to be beyond the reach of people who might want to outlaw abortion, for instance. So they make it fundamental, blah, 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 boom. And yet, what is its source? It's not God. You know, it's, it's something else. So they have made this parody of natural law that makes it over and above, they, they call it super precedent, if you will, uh, so that we mere mortals can't touch it. But it's not God who's created it. All right, so you've got this super precedent fundamental rights that says a woman can murder her unborn child. And we can't touch that, apparently. Well, as Catholics, we don't believe that. Uh, you know, we actually uh, don't have a diluted, namby-pamby natural law. We have the real thing. A natural law says that you cannot kill someone who's made in the image of God, which would be every human being ever conceived. If you're going to have natural law, have natural law. So, but we'll get into that a little bit more later. I will stop and ask, do we have any questions? Like, is it too late for me to get out of here and become Baptist if I got to listen to you every Sunday morning, Buck? <laughs> I don't know, I could use a bullhorn over there, so like Manuel Noriega, so. <laughs> Natural law, yes, sir. I thought Thomas Jefferson was a minister. I thought he was all about religion. It's interesting, and I don't want to get too far, I mean, I, I would love to get too far into this, actually. Um, a separation of church and state, right? 
it's fascinating. I love to I love to step through this. Where's separation of church and state in the Constitution again? Was it? Uh, uh, you feel the trap door, right? You sen you sense it, okay? It's not in the First Amendment. Uh, the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or abridging the free exercise thereof. It doesn't say separation of church and state. You are right that Jefferson was one of the most famous people to use the phrase separation of church and state when he wrote the letter to the Danbury Baptists, I think in 1811, I think, uh, about that time. Something else. Yeah. So now, the interesting thing about that is that Thomas Jefferson was not present for the writing of the Constitution. He was a uh, minister to France at the time. And furthermore, Thomas Jefferson was not directly involved in the drafting of the First Amendment or any of the other Bill of Rights. He and Madison sort of talked about it behind the scene. But Jefferson was not involved in writing the First Amendment. So, so his views on what the First Amendment meant were just Jefferson's views. But this interesting view of separation between church and state, uh, in constitutional terms, that phrase with one very minor exception, did not show up in the Supreme Court jurisprudence until 1947, uh, in which the Supreme Court allowed the use of government money for school buses for sectarian schools. Doesn't sound like a high wall of separation to me. So the Supreme Court got that phrase from Jefferson. Where did Jefferson get the phrase? He got it from Roger Williams, who was a religious dissenter in Massachusetts who founded the colony of Rhode Island. Roger Williams, who I believe was a minister, who said that coerced religion stinketh in the nostrils of God. He says that we need to have a high wall of separation, and here we go, folks, here's the payoff, between the garden of the church and the wilderness of the state. In other words, what, what was the original meaning of that? Today, when you hear separation of church and state, it's usually spoken by seculars to mean, keep your filthy religion out of my government. The actual meaning of that phrase, as first used, was keep your filthy government out of my religion. It's been perverted. And by the way, it doesn't appear in the First Amendment. So, no, Jefferson was a deist. He actually once wrote, uh, rewrote the four Gospels and took out everything out of it that he thought was wrong. Like like miracles. And it's just stupid. It's just stupid to read. Uh, well, Jesus wasn't God. He was just a good man. Well, the one thing that Jesus was not was a good man. He's either what he said he was, which was God, and he actually expressly said it on several occasions, Dan Brown notwithstanding. Maybe that lightning lit, lit him up and he just had to the Jefferson was a hypocrite. I, don't get me started on Jefferson. I don't really like the man. So. Yeah. But either Jesus was God, or he was a filthy liar because he said he was God and he wasn't. And how can you be a good man and a great moral teacher if you're going to lie about something like that? Or he was a lunatic because he really believed he was God and he wasn't. So there's no fourth option. All right. So he was the one thing he was not was merely a good man and a great moral teacher. He's either what he said he was, or he's not worth paying attention to. So Jefferson, go ahead and write your weird gospels, but you know, you're kind of missing the point. Okay, so I've, I've a little gone off topic, but I hope I've taught you a little bit about skepticism to what people say that the law is and what they say it's about. Um, I will stop and ask once again if you have any questions. Even about Jefferson, but don't get me started. Actually, I already did start. Sorry, yes, okay. Well, so, I think now we've got this difference between natural law, which is inherent in the nature of things, and positive law, which is declared. Then there's the matter of the lawgiver. You know, who is, who is deciding what the law is? So, now we can look at these, these uh, basic divisions. The divine positive law. Who's the lawgiver? No brainer. If it's divine positive, right. Yes, so um, God gives the law. An example of a law that is written down saying this is the way things are going to be. And who and God saying it. Best example in Western civilization. Ten Commandments. Yeah, Ten Commandments, that's what's given in the book. It's divine positive law. God says, okay, Moses, take, take a memo. Here is the law. I am speaking this for you. 
I, I, you know, I think there's a touch of natural law in that too, but it's essentially positive because it's actually written down, it's taken down, and it says, all right, Israelites, bam, there it is. That's divine positive. Okay? Then there is, what's the next thing on that list? Somebody read it to me. Hmm? Natural moral. Well, I think we've looked at that a little bit. We're going to look at it a little bit more. Uh, the example given in the book is, is Cain. Now, Cain didn't have a Bible. He didn't have a Ten Commandments. He didn't have anything like that. And yet, after he killed Abel, he knew he'd done something wrong. How did he know he'd done something wrong if it wasn't written down anywhere? Conscience. Conscience. Very, very important in, in the, the Catholic concept of law and authority. Now, conscience, and I would ask Mark this, cause, but he's just wandered off. Conscious, conscience is not just your independent judgment of what to do. It, it, it's not how you feel about things. It's, it's measuring the facts against the dictates of the church, of the divine law, of the natural law, and acting in concert with them. Am I doing all right by that definition? Does that work pretty well? So it's, you know, it's not just what I want to do. I actually have an external measuring stick to measure my actions by a hand. Yeah, uh, it says natural moral law, and then we have the law of nature. Mm -hmm. Are these two divisions of natural law? Well, just as, uh, yeah, it's, they're all natural law, but just as the word law can have different meanings, nature is having a little bit different there. Uh, you could say natural moral law has to do with human nature, uh, because lower animals, uh, as far as we know, don't make moral choices. You know, they live largely by instinct. Uh, so, so the natural moral law is about human will and human decision. Whereas the law of nature, I tend to think of more gravitation, particle physics, uh, the four basic uh, laws of physics, uh, powers of physics, the strong force, the weak force, gravity and electromagnetism, and so on and so forth. So they're all natural, uh, but some pertain specifically to, uh, to human moral action. Make sense? Okay. Okay, so Cain knew in his conscience that the indwelling voice of God was telling him, boy, you screwed up this time. Okay? And this is interesting. Uh, Catholics have to listen to their conscience. The Catholic Church teaches that every person alive, in the end, the ultimate authority, he must listen to his conscience. That's what's called freedom of conscience. I'll say that again. You must listen to your conscience. But... He knew it was coming. You will hear a lot of heterodox dissenters in the Catholic Church say that. Well, I've got to listen to my conscience. Yeah, you do. You must. But the heterodox Catholics, you never hear give this second part of the equation. You never hear them give the second part because that's only one half the equation. The second half of the equation is that the properly formed conscience will never find itself in disagreement with the Catholic magisterium because that was revealed by God himself. So in other words, the properly formed conscience is never going to disagree with God. You'll never hear a Catholic dissenter give that second part of the equation. Only the first part. Yes, we must listen to our conscience. So what happens if you have a Buddhist or a Hindu or an atheist or, well, well let's stick with somebody practicing an Eastern religion, Hindu or a Jainist or something, and he has never even so much as studied the Judeo-Christian scriptures. And yet, by his lights, he is attempting to lead a good life, to do right by his fellow man, uh, and to please his God or gods as he believes uh, they should be pleased. Is that person going to go to heaven? I think so, because he is following his conscience and doing the will of God as he understands it to the best of his ability. All right, so, and, and the fact that he has never had the opportunity to be exposed to Judeo-Christian or Catholic teachings, not his fault, God's not going to hold that against him. Okay, so if you follow your conscience, you're going to be okay. And you will find 
that most of the basic teachings on, on moral practice and moral activity tend to be remarkably consistent if you look at civilizations throughout history and around the world. Uh, how many people here have ever heard of C.S. Lewis? Um, yes, he, he is probably the best known Catholic who never became Catholic. Uh, he was an atheist, Oxfordon, then became Anglican. Uh, but a lot of his teachings are very consonant with what the Catholic Church teaches. Uh, wrote an interesting little book called uh, The Abolition of Man. And in that book he had the, uh, I forget what he called it, the Tao of something. But he looked at the moral teachings of both religions and cultures all over the earth. And it's amazing how similar they are. Okay? And now, you also have to remember that perhaps the manifestation of certain traits may differ from culture to culture, but the underlying idea doesn't change. Example, let's take an American soldier fighting a Japanese soldier in 1943. Uh, cowardice is not a good thing in a soldier. As a matter of fact, I don't think any culture thinks cowardice is good in anyone. Cowardice is just a bad thing. For an American soldier, it would be cowardice to kill himself uh, rather than to be captured. For Japanese, it would be cowardice to be captured rather than kill himself. So the manifestation of what is cowardly may be culturally determined uh, by Bushido in one case or, or the Western value of life on the other. But both of them would agree that cowardice in itself is a bad thing. So this, this shows a natural moral sense that humans throughout time and all over the world, regardless of cultural religion, have instinctively understood. Yes? When did uh, relative moralism start to show its head? That's a good question. I mean, relativism has been all the rage in Western philosophical uh, thought and to a degree theological thought, uh, heterodox thought, for the last hundred years or so. Uh, and I'd have to think about why that is a little bit. I can give you some examples. Um, but uh, you, know, you can probably find, I'm wondering if, uh, if polytheistic societies are relativist by their very nature. I don't know. I'm just I'm asking that as a question. That if Apollo says one thing and Athena, and Athena says another, what do you do? Uh, so uh, you could also say that uh, that when religion was more tribal, that when gods were more personal to the tribe or to the clan, that there might be a relativism. Well, you know, this is the law for me, but it's not for you. And that is that is one of the most important things about Christianity as, as, the Christ, as Christ sends the apostles out to the entire world, that he is emphasizing that this new law, this new covenant, is not just for the tribes of Israel. They are truly universal. Uh, and that's really why the first Christians got in trouble, because they wouldn't act in a relativistic way. Uh, that uh, you know, that they, they got out there and said, this is the truth. Uh, and they were persecuted for it. And anyone living a genuinely Catholic lifestyle today is going to get persecuted for it as well. So I think relativism is, has always been there. As, uh, there's been a huge uptick in it as the official religion of America in the last hundred years or so. Uh, why that is, uh, if you ask me to speculate, it's probably a combination of Einstein and Freud. Uh, that even though the popular imagination did not understand the special theory of relativity, it kind of leaked out in a misunderstood way. And then if you couple that with Freud and the dark demons of our nature that we can't really, we can't even understand our own motivations, uh, you blend those two together and it becomes the, the deification of the individual. Well, I'm not evil, I'm just misunderstood. You know, Hitler, Hitler was just misunderstood. Stalin was just misunderstood. You know, if we just understand these people better, it will be okay, right? So, uh, there are a lot of basic internal contradictions about relativism. How many of you all saw uh, Star Wars and at the very end when Obi-Wan is getting ready to fight 
Anakin Skywalker and uh, Obi-Wan says, uh, only a Jedi believes in absolutes. Anybody got a problem with that? Sounds like a per uh, I mean, only a Sith believes in absolutes, excuse me. Well, that's an absolute statement. That means Obi-Wan must have been a Sith, right? You know, so, uh, you know, there, there is no such thing as truth, as absolute truth. It's all relative. Well, excuse me, do you set that forth as an absolute truth? Moving right along. Uh, so, um, so we've got the divine positive law. We have got the natural moral law by which you listen to your conscience. And then we get into what's next? We've got uh, civil positive, is that right? Civil positive. Okay. Human positive. Human positive. Which is divided into civil and ecclesiastical. Okay, very good. Uh, this, this brings us into a realm that we may be a little more comfortable, I, as a law professor, am a little more comfortable with talking about. What is the U.S. Constitution? Yeah, it's civil positive. It's written down. They decided what they wanted in it. They wrote it down. They said, here's what it's going to be from here on out. It's prescriptive, and it's certainly written by human beings. What is ecclesiastical positive? This is, this is something that may be new to some of you, and I, I wish I'd brought it if I had known I'd be teaching tonight. Yeah, the <laughs> Sunday I'm teaching tonight. Uh, the Code of Canon Law, or, or we'll simply say Canon Law right now. Human positive is a law, any law, that's written down by human beings, uh, usually for the regulation of civil society, the speed limit, the Constitution, uh, you name it. And, and, of course, there are different levels of this. There is the United States Constitution, which is the most fundamental written law in the United States. Won't find anything more fundamental than that. Now, you may find this thing called the fundamental law that legal scholars talk about, uh, but that's not written down. So that's one problem with it. Nobody really knows what it is except the legal scholars who are, you know, seeing it at the time. And we don't have our super-powered fundamental law glasses. We don't know what it is. Um, so you've got the U.S. Constitution. Below that, you've got treaties. You've got laws of Congress. You've got somewhere in there executive orders. Uh, then you've got the law set forth by state governments and all the way on down to city ordinances of the city of Macon. So within, uh, within human civil law, positive law, you've got a hierarchy. All right? Some are more important than others. Uh, and we can use that uh, as an example uh, when we look at some divine law, some... Uh, 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 ecclesiastical law, and we'll look at that in a few minutes. But I want to come back right now to this issue of abortion. Okay? What happens if the highest legal authorities in the United States say that abortion is legal and acceptable? Is it legal? Is it acceptable? Is it moral? But, yeah, let's focus on that last one. You have people who, who really don't think very reflectively on this, that, that law is somehow related to... The, the interesting is law is somehow related to morality. You get a few different views of this. Some people say, well, because it's legal, it's moral. Well, slavery was once legal in the United States. It was absolutely legal. It was constitutionally protected. Somebody want to make an argument for me that it was moral. Okay, and that was, that was one of the things that led to the Civil War. The fact that it was, at, it was unassailably, you could not even, have you ever heard of the laugh test? A laugh test is if you can make an argument before the judge and the judge doesn't bust out laughing, you pass the laugh test. All right? An argument that slavery was not constitutional in 1860 or 1800 would not pass the laugh test. It just would not do it. And yet, it was wrong. Okay, the, the parallels between slavery and abortion are absolutely striking. Uh, at some point, I may hand out my parallel. And that's to show you that, uh, that this idea of, of not accepting, in a sense, the legitimacy of human law when it is measured against divine law 
Uh, this is a scary thing for civil authorities. Uh, it makes potential subversives of us all, or so they're scared, you know, so they're scared of, uh, that may turn out. But there are a couple of thoughts. There is, uh, I think the word is authoritas, authoritas, and potestas. And one is a legitimate authority. And the other is just power. All right, I, it's, it's going to happen because I say it's going to happen, and it doesn't matter whether or not it's right. And you have to understand that often law and morality, as we understand it, as Christians, as Judeo-Christians, as Catholics, that law and morality are not going to seem to have much to do with each other because the morality on which the civil law is based is not morality at all. It's not acceptable morality. It's very important. On the other hand, you will see, once again, these secularists who talk about separation of church and state, without understanding the phrase, say, you know, we cannot legislate morality. Well, I'd ask you right now, can somebody name me one law that is not based on somebody's morality? Name one, anyone. What about stop at red and go at green? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, but that's a natural law. I'm talking about a positive law. If it's hot, it burns is a good example of natural law. If you jump off the tower, you're going to get hurt. Um, well, red means stop and green means go. What, what is moral about that? Well, the fact is we are legislating that it's good for some people to stop so other people can go at certain times because if you don't stop at red and go at green, then there are going to be traffic accidents and people are going to die, and that's, <gasps> that's bad. Whoops, I've just injected morality into the law. The minute you start talking about bad and good effects, you're talking morality. So every single law ever passed has been based on morality at some level. So this idea that you can't legislate morality, we're always legislating morality. It's a question of whose morality we're legislating. All right? And right now the morality, I'll come back to abortion because it's you know, a great example right now in our history. Uh, that the current status of, uh, of the availability of abortion is being legislated by people who believe that human life is not intrinsically valuable. There's no way around it. You know, they say, well, it's not a human life. Well, it's alive. Biological process it. He or she is alive. Biological processors are going on in the fetus. And if you do a DNA test, that DNA is human. 46 human chromosomes human being. It's alive. Uh, if you say that we can kill that human being, we are devaluing a human life. And that means all human life. Yeah. In uh, Roe versus Wade, yes. did the Supreme Court define when life began? Um, I'm not sure they actually did. They, they looked at the common law history that traditionally life was taken to begin at what was called quickening, when you felt movement in the womb. And more recently, Nancy Pelosi, the great Catholic theologian, has told us that the Catholic Church, you know, has, you know, has said that too. You know, no, we've never known that. Uh, well, we've only recently known that, I guess in the past couple of hundred years. But that's never been the basis to decide on when abortion was acceptable, certainly in Judeo-Christian terms. Uh, so. Uh, I don't think they did, and I think they punted in the end. They just said that, you know, at some point along this continuum, the state has got a greater interest in protecting the life or the potential life. And, of course, as technology changes, you know, that point's probably going to get earlier and earlier. So that makes us all, you know, your life a function of technology. Yeah. Yeah, third week. That's getting pretty early. Well, I'll give you, I'll, I'll talk straight science for a minute, which is kind of getting off topic. But what is the one thing that you have had for your entire existence and you will continue to have until your death? So, uh, well, besides that, something, something you can put under a microscope, because you can't do that to a soul. I would say a genetic code. And you've got that at the instant of conception, a unique genetic code that has probably never been shared by anyone, barring a twin, 
that has ever existed. So, yeah. I'm trying to get my head around this, mm -hmm. this moral, the, the moral law is driving the civil law. Well, I, I would argue that every civil law ever passed has a value judgment driving it. Right. Now, that value judgment may or may not be consonant with Catholic teaching. Right, and you said whose morality, it really comes down to whose morality is being legislated. Yes, correct. And so in Roe versus Wade and abortion, the, the argument that was made was that the woman had the right, moral right to take care of her, her, her own body. You know, I'll, I will tell you what the, what the, and I don't want to get too far into this because this could turn into an abortion discussion and we just don't have time for that. But essentially, in, in Fifth or Fourteenth Amendment terms, the life interest of the unborn child was put up against the liberty interest of the mother, the liberty to control her life. And normally speaking, life trumps liberty and liberty trumps property. But so the only way, the only way that the woman could win in that case is to say that the unborn child has no life interest worth protecting. Uh, and that's what the Supreme Court did. Interestingly enough, that's exactly the way the Supreme Court protected slavery in 1857. The slave owner said, I've got a property interest in this slave. The slave says, I've got a liberty interest in not being a slave. And liberty trumps property. And the Supreme Court says, yeah, slaves don't have any interests at all. Uh, to quote the Supreme Court, the black man has no rights which the white man is bound to respect. You substitute in Roe versus Wade. The unborn child has no rights which the mother is bound to respect. Yeah. The, the other similarity is that there is a long history in America, even Thomas Jefferson wrote a book about the idea that slaves weren't actually the people. So there's a similarity there of taking away someone's life interest by negating their, their life interests, by negating the fact that they're alive. Mm -hmm. uh, excluding them from the community, I like to think. That, that, that blacks were not somehow part of the community. And what does that word community means? In union with each other. And you know, I think that's wonderful constant with the, the Catholic word communion. You know, that, that somehow in Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court, using this fundamental law, is excluding our unborn sisters and brothers from the communion of humanity, just as whites 150 years ago excluded African Americans from the communion of what it meant to be an American. Uh, so, and, and, and the arguments just don't hold up, but I think that's as far as we can go with abortion right now, but I think we've seen this uh, I hope you now understand the relationship or lack thereof between law and morality, between civil law, human positive law and morality. Yes, sir. Just another take on um, legislating morality. It doesn't seem that in the current state of affairs, no one is concerned about legislating against greed. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, greed is one of the, the, original, the seven deadly sins. Yes, you know, it's acquisitiveness, pride, it's about me. Bankers and, and stock traders and everything. Yeah, uh, the problem is, and, and that is where, uh, where policy comes into play, uh, abortion is an intrinsic evil. It can never be good. Uh, but, and, and greed, we'll get back to the idea of cowardice, greed is not good either. But greed is more intangible. All right, so how do we stop greed? What is the best way to limit it? Or let's take, let's take hunger. Hunger is evil. All right, hunger, hunger is terrible, the fact that we're all well-fed and there are people starving on the streets. How do we best feed them? There can be legitimate disagreements as to the best way of ensuring that we have the least number of hungry people possible. You know, so there can be legitimate policy disagreements as to how to do that. Uh, that's a little bit different from abortion, you know, that, uh, you know, that abortion's just, you know, it's wrong. You know, you, it's just wrong. So it's a, what's called an intrinsic evil. But that's a very good point. You know that, uh, you know that the Catholic Church very clearly says abortion is wrong. It also says hunger is wrong, but it doesn't get into the details of how we alleviate hunger as a society. Uh, that's a matter for Catholic social teaching, and there is room for disagreement and discussion on that. Uh, so.
All right, last point is ecclesiastical positive law, and that's canon law. Now, canon law, and today we have a thing called the Code of Canon Law. Uh, that first came around in 1917, and the new version, I think, is 1983. But prior to that, there were canons. It was just the, the canons were just not all put into one place. But there have been canons for at least 15, 1,600 years. And you remember how I was talking about there's a hierarchy in the civil law, the Constitution, laws of Congress, uh, state laws, and so on and so forth. There's sort of a, a hierarchy in church law. Obviously, the Ten Commandments is way on up near the top. Canon law is near the bottom because it's more concerned with, with how we dispense the divine law of God. So canon law uh, might tell you under what circumstances a priest can celebrate mass or hear confessions. Uh, it can tell you uh, how individual Catholics are to behave in certain matters regarding liturgy or marriage or annulment or how adult Catholics are to be brought into the church. You, you might think of, of it as the administrative law of the church. Now, it's not like the Ten Commandments. Uh, it, it, it doesn't have that level of infallibility or moral importance. Uh, but it needs to be respected and followed in order for uh, an orderly internal self-governance of the church, of which you are members. Uh, now, once again, there is policy involved in canon law. We are not, we're not talking here about murder, for instance. Murder is part of the divine law, it's part of the divine positive law, it's part of natural moral law. Murder's wrong, murder's always wrong, it's always been wrong, it's always going to be wrong. Uh, end of story. Um, but how many times can you receive communion in one day? Yeah, there's some policy behind that, all right? You have to follow that rule that's in place, but that rule can change. It has changed, and it may change again depending on circumstances. You can't say mass on Good Friday. Just can't do it, okay, according to canon law. Twenty years ago when there was an earthquake in, on, on Holy Thursday in Central America and thousands of people died, um, they, you know, they changed that. They said, okay, you can, in this country, say mass on Good Friday. You need to do it. All right? you know, it's not like changing the laws against murder. It's, it's an administrative part of canon law. Uh, it's very interesting. I'll put in a couple of plugs here and then I'll start winding down. We have a thing in the United States called the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Uh, and canonically, they actually don't have much authority. They like to act as if they do. But they have made some really bad calls over the years. Uh, up until the early 70s, every Friday was an, a day of abstinence uh, to remind you of Good Friday. Okay, it was the day that Christ died that we killed him to atone for our sins. And, and we needed to, to somehow remember that. And the way we did that was to abstain from meat every Friday of the year. That was a part of canon law. Uh, just like in Lent, every Sunday is a miniature Easter because that's Resurrection Day. You don't observe Lent during, Easter, or during, uh, during Sunday. Well. Around 74, the bishops, in what I think to be a terribly misguided attempt to help Catholics fit into American society better, terrible mistake, wrote this letter, wrote these guidelines. And folks, I'm a lawyer, okay? I read complicated stuff. I do it for a living. They had to try to make this language, this complicated, as to whether or not Fridays were going to continue to be a day of abstinence. I can't figure it out. I've read the thing ten times. I can't figure it out. Well, what's happened? Because they fudged so badly, because I believe they deliberately tried to fudge it, you won't find one Catholic in a hundred in this country that observes Friday abstinence year-round anymore. Well, my answer is simple. If I can't understand this, what do you get when you cross a lawyer with the Godfather? You get an offer you can't understand. <laughs> huh? Since I can't read this thing and I can't understand what it says, for me, 
Friday abstinence in the Universal Code of Canon Law still stands. Women wearing mantillas at Mass, it still stands. Uh, the, the U.S. bishops have muddied the waters in this. So you know, if you ask me, you need to observe Friday abstinence every Friday of the year. Uh, I mean, that's, that's my opinion as a canon lawyer who actually doesn't have a license to practice canon law. Um, but, but once again, the bishops could come out tomorrow, or, or certainly Bishop Bolin could come out tomorrow with a very clearly worded thing saying, we're going to observe abstinence from meat every day of the year. Okay, As if he's got the canonical authority to do that. Uh, it's not like abortion or murder or greed or whatever. It's administrative law. It has changed. It can change. It will change. So that is a whirlwind tour through Catholic law. I'll stop now and ask if you've got any questions. Like Buck, if we took up a collection to do plastic surgery on your face, would you accept it? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, well, I'll, I'll take an example. Uh, does one receive... Uh, well, let me ask you this. Um, I, I guess a lot of you are looking forward to your first communion, right? How many of you are planning to take both the bread and the wine? Raise your hand. How many of you are planning to take just the bread? How many are you planning to take just the wine? Anyone who raised his hand is a heretic. It's not bread and it's not wine, okay? Sorry, that was another trapdoor moment. All right, the, but you, you know that that it's political correctness. The way you talk about something affects the way you think about it. It's bread right up to the point when the priest consecrates it. After that, looks like bread, smells like bread, tastes like bread. In its very essence, it ain't bread. Same for the wine. Looks like wine, tastes like wine. Get you drunk like wine. It ain't wine. It is the precious blood, uh, and we need you to help teach your fellow Catholics that because some of them still speak in that terribly strange so, All right. Uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, I can't give you the exact year, but because of abuses regarding the precious blood, very good, um, that the church said we are not going to, as only normal, at normal masses, distribute the precious blood to the laity, just the host, just the body of Christ. Uh, first of all, to show that body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ are contained entirely in each element. If you receive either element, you're receiving the whole of Christ. Uh, and, and secondly, we don't want to be spilling the precious blood all over the place in a mad spree to, to well, as the ancient prayer goes, blood of Christ inebriate me. Uh, so, uh, so there was, you know, there was a reason for that. And it was only in the last 40 years or so that the precious blood became more available. Uh, last year in the diocese, because of the uh, flu, was it the swine flu last year? Uh, the fears for that, Bishop Bowler made a decision to begin withholding the precious blood from the laity out of fears that it might spread some contagion. So we have, uh, we have stayed with that in this church. So there are, there are reasons for these laws. I don't think I could tell you the reason for every one of them. But, uh, but every law has some sort of reason, has some sort of policy that it is trying to achieve uh, in the Code of Canon Law. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, and, and you'll see that, that law, you know, laws are not made in a vacuum. They are made in response to events, and events can actually take place in certain eras with certain concerns. Uh, taking place at that time. So, and that's why we change them. Because, uh, once again, uh, as a lawyer say, if the reason for a law disappears, then that law itself should become non-operable because it's no longer serving a purpose. Uh, you know, the, the purpose of all of these laws, let's don't get away from this important view, and this is how I want to end up. The purpose of all of, of the laws of the church are to help you lead a Christian life to inform your conscience and to help you lead the life that God wants you to lead. You know, it's not designed to hurt you or limit you or punish you. Uh, you know, the warning on the electric hair dryer that says don't stick this thing in water while it's running is not designed to hurt you. It's designed to protect you. It's designed to help you know the truth and live a better life. That's what every law 
but whether it be the Ten Commandments or a mere canon in the current code of canon law. That's what every Catholic law is designed to do. And we need to keep that in mind. We don't want to become Pharisaic about following these laws.